Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a beautiful presence that we feel this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and being with us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to ask you to stay standing. And if you'll take your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 5 today. And while you're turning there, I just want to comment on the video that you saw with Vanessa Maddox. I want to encourage you ladies. This is our first gathering that we will have had just as ladies since about a year ago. So this is kind of exciting. We can all be together. Vanessa Maddox is going to be with us. I'll be sharing a devotion. And we'll also be taking communion together. And it's been a really long time since just as a ladies group that we've taken communion together. So I want to encourage you, mark your calendars, May 22nd, 6 o'clock, right here in the sanctuary. Bring a friend. Bring your daughters. We'll have nursery available for the little ones, but come. I know you're going to be blessed. I know the Lord is going to strengthen you. And I want to say happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. I just want to remind you too, like Pastor said, that what you do every day is important. So don't quit. Don't go on strike. It is important. It's important for today and it's important for eternity. And I pray that as you seek the Lord for his wisdom and his guidance, that Proverbs 24.4 will be true in your home. The rooms of your house will be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. The rooms of your house will be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Amen? In the name of Jesus. All right. We're in Mark chapter 5. Everybody have it? We're going to begin reading in verse 21 down to verse 34, and I'm reading from the New King James today. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. Now, Jesus had been over to the area of the Gadarenes, and he had just delivered the man in the tombs from a legion of demons, and so now he's coming back. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now that word thronged there is often used as the same word throughout scripture as the word choked, as choked. So that gives us a kind of a, I think a a little clearer picture of how tightly this crowd was crowding in around Jesus, almost as if he were being choked. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and she touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched me? Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? But Jesus knew this was a different kind of touch. And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Let's pray this morning. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your sweet presence that we have already sensed and felt in this room. We know that you are here with us. And now, Father, has come the time for your word, for you to speak some meat into us, Lord. 
to give us some solidity, O Lord, to what we have felt. And I pray right now that you would open our ears in the name of Jesus to hear your word and to receive it. I pray that there would be a faith arising in each one of us as we're hearing your words today. I pray for your anointing upon me. I pray for clarity of speech, Father, that it is your words that are spoken today. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will not leave this place the same way we came in. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in advance. In Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. You may be seated. What a beautiful story of faith. Actually, it's two stories of faith here that we have. We have two people who are in desperate need of a miracle from Jesus. There's Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. Now, a synagogue was the public gathering place where The Jews would go to pray, they would go to read the Bible, to hear the scriptures read, they would hear religious leaders talk about the scripture, and they were built in smaller towns because only Jerusalem had the temple. So the synagogue was a place for God's people to go and worship when they weren't in Jerusalem. And Jairus was one of the leaders of that synagogue who oversaw the activities at the synagogue. He was probably very well known in the community, had probably a certain measure of authority or prestige. And he had come to Jesus on behalf of his daughter who was very sick. Now it's interesting that the woman in this story is simply introduced to us as a certain woman. We don't know her name, but we know that she is also in need of a miracle. She's had a bleeding disorder for 12 years and she's gone to every doctor in town, every doctor outside of town. She's tried every medical treatment, she's spent all her money, and instead of getting better, she's only getting worse. Nothing has helped. For 12 years, she has suffered. Jairus, on the other hand, has experienced 12 wonderful years with his daughter but now she's very sick. And if you look down in verse 42, you'll see there that that the daughter's age is given. So we know that she's 12. So the same period of time, but two totally different lived experiences. Jairus has a position in town, well-respected, looked up to, but this certain woman, because of her physical condition, she's considered an outcast. She is ceremonially unclean. That means she's not allowed to participate in any social gathering, any religious gathering. She she can't be touched or she can't be hugged. You can't shake her hand because anyone who touches her is also unclean. This was truly the ultimate social distancing, the ultimate quarantine. So it wasn't just the physical pain the disappointments of no one being able to help her and she has no money, but she has experienced extreme social isolation, just being kept away from everyone, every activity, and it's gone on for 12 long years. She is desperate. She is just as desperate as Jairus is for a miracle from Jesus. But where Jairus can go publicly and go up to Jesus and ask him for help, We actually see it in verse 22 where he bows down at the feet of Jesus. This certain woman is hiding in the crowd. She really wasn't even supposed to be there. She couldn't make a public display of her need because of the nature of her condition. But she is just as desperate, maybe even more so. And she is so desperate that she risked being seen in the crowd that day. And she begins to maneuver herself close enough just to be able to touch his clothes, just to get a little close to him. And I love how Mark's gospel and also in Matthew, they share with us what she is thinking. They share with us her thoughts. They tell us that she's thinking this, if only I could touch his clothes. 
Now it's thought that on the edge of Jesus's outer coat were tassels, little tassels that would have hung down. And these tassels were actually ordained by God for his people back in Leviticus in the Old Testament. And the purpose of these tassels weren't weren't just to serve as a decoration on the coat, but rather as a reminder of the covenant that God had made with his people. They were a covenant people. And so every time that they saw the tassel or they felt it move, they were reminded to keep the commandments of the Lord God Jehovah. So it's very possible in keeping with that custom that Jesus would have had tassels on his coat. And many Bible scholars feel that this is what the woman was reaching out to touch. She wanted to touch something that belonged to Jesus. She had heard about him. She had heard about his miracles. She had heard about his his great power. And she knew, she just knew it, that if I can get to him, if I can get to some part of him, no matter what it is, I can be healed. Oh, what incredible faith. She truly was risking everything just by being in the crowd, but she was so desperate. She has no other hope, and she's heard of his great power. She has to get to this man, Christ Jesus. You know, it's okay for us to be without any other hope. It's okay to be at your absolute end. Because often that is when we will reach out with even greater intensity to the only one who can truly help us. That's when desperate faith kicks in. And there was a desperate faith that kept her pressing in in this crowd. She was probably being trampled on. She was probably being kicked and maybe they were shouting at her. She didn't care. I've got to touch Jesus. I've got to get close enough, even if it's just close enough to touch his clothes. And she did. Hallelujah. She did. She did not give up. She kept pushing her way in until she reached out and she touched his clothes. She grabbed that tassel. And Mark tells us immediately, I love that word, immediately. That means without delay, right then, at once. She was healed and she knew it. The Bible describes it for us that she knew it. She felt it in her body. She was healed of that affliction. What, 12 years of doctor's appointments, 12 years of medical treatments, 12 long years in one moment. In one moment, the power of Jesus had done for her what nothing and no one else could do for this woman. Oh, the power of Jesus in one moment. Oh, don't you agree? We serve a mighty, mighty, powerful Savior in one moment. She was healed. But you know, she doesn't have a lot of time to bask in this wonderful moment because Jesus knew it too. (laughs) He knew that healing power had gone out of his body. And so he turns around to the crowd, all these people, and he starts asking, who touched me? And in Luke's writing of this story, he says Jesus verbalized it out loud. Somebody touched me for I perceived power going out from me. Now, of course, the disciples were totally bewildered. And Luke writes it was Peter, which we probably can all you know, understand that, that it being Peter, he turns to Jesus with like a what? There's a million people here. They're all touching you. (laughs) But Jesus knew this was a different kind of touch. And he wasn't trying to embarrass this woman. He wasn't going to shame her for being out and about in the crowd that day. But he wanted her to understand something very important. I think it's something that we need to hear today. The power of Jesus is directly connected to the person of Jesus. 
the power of Jesus is directly connected with the person of Jesus. His, his power is not some impersonal cosmic energy thrown out there. No, it's, it's directly, absolutely connected to him, to the person, to the very son of God. There's an intimate relationship that goes with being touched by the power of Jesus. Jesus' power is not just to give us some kind of boost or some kind of power surge to take us to the next spiritual level. He's a person that we need to know and he's a person we need to have a relationship with. Jesus didn't want to just exert power over her physical need, but he wanted to make her completely whole. And that included touching her spirit, touching her soul, having a relationship with her. She could have gotten to heaven with a broken body, but she couldn't have got to heaven with a broken soul. She needed Jesus more than a physician. She needed him to be a savior, to be Lord and to be master of her life. She needed him to be her friend. She needed someone who sticks closer than a brother. Jesus knew there was much more to this certain woman than just her physical needs. And he wanted to bring her out of her shame, out of her condemnation, and bring her close to him in a personal, intimate relationship. That's what every encounter with Jesus is all about. It's not just about his power healing our bodies or his power changing our situation. It's about a relationship with him. It's about communion and, and fellowship and talking and connecting with him. He wants to save us. He wants to bring us into spiritual oneness with him. And he wants that more than anything else. So Jesus stops the entire procession on the way to Jairus' house and he looks over this crowd of people all pressing him, choking him, and he's looking for whomever it was that had touched him. Now obviously Jesus knew who it was. He knows everything. But it was critical for this lady to step out and to give testimony that she had been healed. And I believe it was necessary for Jairus to hear her story. Jairus might have known this lady. Maybe he had had to run her out of the synagogue on some of her desperate days when she just wanted to pray or just wanted to hear the scripture and she wasn't clean, she couldn't come. Jairus needed to know she was clean now. She was healed now. <laughs> he needed to see and he needed to hear her miracle to build up his own faith. And Jesus knew it was necessary for this lady to get up from the place where she'd been crawling on the ground to get to him. She needed to speak out. She needed to share. She needed to tell her story. It was part of the, the bigger package for her complete and total healing. It wasn't to embarrass her, to shame her, but to encourage her, give glory to God, let everybody know I am healed. No more social distancing, hallelujah. She could be hugged, she could be touched, she was healed. Jesus, of course, he already knew her story, but he wanted her to tell it in her own words, with her own emotions. And when she did, he responds in verse 48 with some powerful phrases. Let's read them again. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And what we see there is he first addresses her with a beautiful term of endearment. Daughter, daughter. This spoke of a, a family connection. It was a, a blood connection. She belonged. Oh, how that must have thrilled her. 
She was a part of something bigger now than even the community where she lived. She was the daughter of the most high king. She wasn't just a certain woman anymore. She was now daughter. Jesus called her daughter. She belonged to him. And it was exactly what her dry and thirsty soul needed to hear. Daughter. Then he tells her, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. Jesus highlights not only for her, but for Jairus and the crowd watching all of this, that it was her faith in him that had made her well. And the wording there, made you well, is translated to actually mean saved from sin. So Jesus wasn't just speaking of physical wellness, but he was also addressing her spiritual wellness. Jesus knew her greatest need was not that blood disorder, but it was the condition of her soul. She needed to be cleansed from her sins, not just healed from this incurable disease. It was her faith in him her faith that he was the only answer, her faith that Jesus was exactly what she needed. It was her faith that brought this physical healing, but more importantly, a spiritual healing and a restoration. Hebrews 11:6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he is that he is the great I am, that he is the Messiah, that he is all that our souls need and long for. He is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And without a doubt, that woman had been diligently seeking him, pressing in no matter the cost, no matter what it looked like, and he had rewarded her faith, her faith in him. Oh, it was critical that Jairus understood this truth. It's important that we understand this. Jesus wanted this lady to understand that it was not that she had grabbed the tassels on his coat, but it was her faith in him that had changed her life. Otherwise, just being very human, she could have walked away from that moment and suddenly become an idol worshiper of tassels and of coats. Aren't we all like that? (laughs) She could have begun to put her focus and her belief in something tangible, something that she could touch, something that she could hold on to. And Jesus was teaching something greater here than just touching coats or tassels. He was gonna leave and go back to heaven She was going to have to keep believing by faith whether she could touch him or not, whether she could see him or not. And I believe this is why Jesus did not allow Mary Magdalene to touch him in the garden after he had resurrected. He knew her understanding at that moment was to physically touch him and be relieved of her pain and her sorrow. He was alive, she'd seen him, she wanted to touch him. But Jesus wanted her to believe he was alive without touching him. He told Thomas, blessed are those who have believed and haven't seen. It is by faith that we receive, not by physically making a grab for the coat or for the tassel. Now, let me add a little little side note here. I believe this coat or this tassel that the lady was reaching for was a point of contact for her to exercise her faith. The power wasn't in the coat. The power was in Jesus. Her connection to that power was through her faith in Jesus, but by reaching out for the tassel, it was helping her exercise or put movement to her faith. It's very similar to what we see in Acts chapter five, where Peter's shadow 
when it was cast over people, they were healed. Also in Acts 19, there were handkerchiefs and there were aprons that were brought for Paul to touch, to pray over, and then those were taken to those who were sick and they were healed. There wasn't anything miraculous in the handkerchief. It, you know, it wasn't made out of some kind of holy fabric. It was the faith of the people reaching out and these objects, Peter's shadow, the aprons, they were simply a point of contact for them to exercise their faith in Christ, to press in with their faith. So these tangible things can become a helper to us in our, in our faith journey, in our spiritual journey, but the object itself is not where our faith lies. Our faith lies in Jesus Christ. Our faith lies in the person of Jesus Christ. So these things only serve as a reminder as we see it or as we touch it that we are ultimately seeking him. So they are just a point of, of contact for us for our faith. I've made reference often of a very difficult time that I went through with depression in my early 20s. <laughs> I don't want to be 20 again. <laughs> I loved Jesus and I knew in my head that he loved me, but somehow life had just gotten a little bit tangled and that connection in my spirit was separated from that truth and I just felt so alone. Everything was so dark, it was overwhelming, I lost a lot of weight, I ended up in the hospital, it just, it was not a fun time. But I stayed committed with holy habits. Praying, reading my Bible, going to church, listening, singing only his songs, fellowshipping with other believers, sometimes just plotting step by step, day by day, just doing what I knew to do was the right thing. And often at night, which was the hardest for me, I would take my Bible and I would place it under my pillow and I would put my hand on it and that's how I would go to sleep. Now it was not that that particular Bible was a good luck charm. It was simply my point of contact that as I believed the words in that Bible and I believed the God who had spoken those words, I was reaching out in faith that I was going to be healed. I had read those words, I had memorized those words, I had prayed those words, and I just needed to touch that Bible. I needed to touch those words to physically remind myself, corral my emotions, corral my thoughts. His word is true. His word is forever settled in the heavens. His word is going to heal me. It will not return void. I can stand on his word. It was a point of contact for me, for my faith, to remind me of the Christ who is the word and who does the healing. I could have carried my Bible everywhere. I could have worn it on my head like a hat. But until I read those words, until I got them into my mind and my spirit, until I believed those words, the book itself was not gonna help me. It was not a good luck charm. It was my faith in the God of this book. <laughs> it was my faith in the one who had spoken these words who was gonna heal me. And I can vividly remember the very last time I ever experienced a panic attack that was so common for me in that season. I was in the room alone and I grabbed my Bible and I began to read the Psalms loudly. I was by myself, loudly, chapter after chapter, verse after verse, praying, crying out to the God of this book. And very soon, his sweet presence, as I was holding that book and reading his words, he came into that room and he filled my very being. He filled my mind and he healed me once in for all. It was my faith, my desperate, desperate faith in him. I believed him, the one who had written these incredible words. It was this lady's faith in Jesus that had made her well. 
Yes, it was admirable that she bravely came out of her house and she pressed in that crowd. Oh, but what saved her soul, what healed her body, what healed me was my faith in Jesus Christ. It was Jesus that I was after. I knew he had the answer and he was the only one who could help me. This lady knew he was the only one who could help her. And Jesus recognized that. He publicly recognized her faith, her faith in him. Jairus needed to hear that. His own faith was going to be severely tested just a few verses later. His servant comes to tell him, don't trouble the master. Your daughter has died. But Jesus wanted Jairus to keep believing just like this certain woman had done. You keep your faith in me, Jairus, not in what you see around you, not in what you hear, but you stay focused on me. Oh, what a great exhortation for us this morning. We must keep our faith in Christ, not in the things around us, not even good things, not even things that represent Jesus Christ. Our faith must be in him and him alone. We've been tested this past year as as we weren't able to come meet together as a group. Meeting together, coming to church, it's a good thing. It's something God ordained and he's commanded us to do it, amen? (laughs) But our faith wasn't in coming to church. Our faith was in Jesus Christ. We, We couldn't have all the Sunday school classes we were used to having, all the social gatherings that we enjoy. Those are good things but our faith had to stay in him. No matter what is going on around us, our faith must stay in Jesus Christ. This is a faith that pleases him. This is the faith that turns the heart of God toward us and he blesses us and he strengthens us and he gives us exactly what we need. Aren't you grateful, aren't you grateful? The other thing that Jesus says to this lady is go in peace, go in peace. Now it wasn't just a peace that she was healed. She had his peace now. (laughs) She had the peace of Jesus flowing all through her. John 14, 27 tells us his peace is not like any other peace. It's not a peace that the world and all its things can give us but it's a peace that keeps your heart from being troubled when trouble is all around. It's a peace that keeps you from being fearful when there's lots of fearful stuff all around and you're overwhelmed. It's a peace that passes all understanding. Philippians 4, 7 tells us that. You know, it passes all understanding. That means we don't have to understand, but we can still be at peace. This lady didn't need to understand why she had been sick for 12 long years. I did the math. She was sick 9,861 days. That's a lot of days. She didn't need to understand all that. She could ask why if she wanted to, but it wasn't important anymore. She had the peace of Jesus. She didn't need to understand why she had lost all her money. She didn't need to understand why medicine and that fancy doctor had failed her. It just didn't matter now. She had the peace of Jesus in her heart, in her mind, and she was well. There were probably things that this lady faced later on in her life, maybe even bigger things than that blood disorder but she could face them with peace because of her faith in Christ. Eventually she died, she's not around anymore. But even that, she could face with peace. Oh, the power of the peace of Jesus. It guards our hearts, it guards our minds, and it gives us the strength to go. Jesus told her, go in peace, go. She had an assignment to fulfill. She had something to do for the kingdom of God. She was to go. 
to go forward, get busy serving the Lord, doing his will in her life. And she could do it now with boldness, with confidence, no shame. She had his peace. She had his peace. And the last thing, musicians, will you come? Jesus tells her, be healed of your affliction. Jesus confirms her healing is complete. Her physical body is healed. Her spiritual man has been restored now into relationship with God the Father. She is cleansed, she is well. And I read this same passage in the New Living Translation and I really like the way it says it. Your suffering is over. Your suffering is over. This speaks of a newness, a new way of living, a new way of thinking. Everything is going to be fresh and new for her. She has a new song to sing. The suffering of the past 12 years is over. And and this also confirms to us that Jesus knew what those 12 years were like. They had been years of suffering. They had been years of affliction. He had seen her pain. He he knew every doctor's appointment. He had watched that bank account go down and down with every treatment. He had seen the loneliness, the isolation. He knew all about it. And he called it for what it was, suffering, affliction. There's an old hymn that says, My Lord keeps a record of the moments I'm living down here. He knows all about me, all my troubles, my sorrows, my fears. It's not a record of our sins. Those have been cast away. But it's that he has seen our sorrows. He has seen our griefs. He has seen our affliction and our suffering. Jesus did not dismiss the 12 years of pain. He did not pretend that they never happened. He knew all about them. But oh, he's reminding her that season is over. Be healed of your affliction. Your suffering is over. Those 12 years would only be a memory and it would not be a memory that would haunt her, but rather it would simply give a greater highlight to the miracle that she was now living every day. Those 12 years would not be a chain binding her mind or her spirit, but they would serve to magnify the miracle she was enjoying. The suffering was over. And she could go on her way rejoicing as a daughter of the Most High, completely well in body and in spirit. Oh, what powerful words for her to hear and for Jairus to hear as he kept walking with Jesus to his house. Now we're not gonna read that part of the story. That's actually your homework today. Finish Mark chapter five. But Jairus needed to, to hear and to see this lady's story completely unfold to build his faith and to be strengthened. And I believe we needed to hear it today. We needed to hear her story today. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I believe Jesus is speaking to us the same words that he told that certain woman many years ago. He wants to call us out as sons and daughters. He wants us to know there's a family connection. There's a blood connection now. You're his son. You're his daughter. He wants you to have your faith be only in Him. Nothing else, just Jesus Christ. And He wants us to leave this place today walking out with peace, with peace that will guard our hearts and our minds in whatever that we're facing. And I believe He wants to tell some of us specifically here today, your suffering is over. Your suffering is over. So I'm gonna ask you if you would, we're gonna pray this morning, just right where you're standing, bow your heads, close your eyes. 
Is there anyone here today you need to hear the words that Jesus spoke to this woman? Maybe you need to hear him say, daughter or son. There's some kind of earthly parental vacancy there in your life. Just raise your hand right where you are. We're gonna pray right, right there. Jesus wants to call you daughter or son. Maybe you need to be reconciled to him as God the Father. You need a new way of salvation. Do you need to walk in his peace? Do you wanna receive that peace this morning? Just raise your hand right where you are. We're gonna pray. Maybe it's just a deeper commitment to him. Maybe you just need his presence. Oh, a greater, deeper relationship with him in your situation. If you are just as desperate as that lady today, I'm gonna ask you just raise your hand and we're gonna pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I see hands all over the, the room today. Jesus is here with us. Just like he had come back from the Gadarenes that day for that lady, he has come here this morning. We have already felt his presence and I know he is here and we're gonna pray. As I pray for you, I invite you. You verbalize and you tell Jesus exactly what it is that you need. Jesus, we call upon you today. I call upon you, Lord, on behalf of my brothers and sisters asking Jesus that you would reach out, oh Lord, by your power, your power that is so mighty, your power that can do it immediately, that you would bring healing, healing to the body in the name of Jesus, healing to the soul in the name of Jesus. Whatever that need is today, Jesus, you would pour it out abundantly without measure upon your church today in the name of Jesus. Your peace, Father, your peace, Father, right now, your peace, Father, right now. I pray, Lord, that we could hear your word say to us, your suffering is over and we could receive it by faith in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. name. Lord, we give you thanks. Can we just begin to praise him now for what he has done? Lord, we give you thanks in advance. We give you thanks, we give you thanks, and we give you praise, Father. You have been so faithful to your church, to your people, hallelujah. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power, Lord. There is nothing too hard for you to do. And we give you praise this morning. We give you thanks, hallelujah, hallelujah. Can we just give the Lord A hand clap of praise. He is a mighty, mighty God. And we worship him today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I just want to thank you all for being here today. God bless you. God bless all of our moms. Please take care of your moms today. If she's not with you, give her a call and tell her happy Mother's Day. I love you. (laughs) And enjoy your day. We will see you on Wednesday for Pastor's Bible Study. God bless you.